Today's conversation is replacing the Iron and Steel Heritage Partnership's annual meeting when our partner sites gather to share all their upcoming programs for the summer. We had hoped to welcome our guests from the Iron Bridge Gorge in Shropshire, England, to meet with us in person last year, but the worldwide pandemic stopped that. Today, thanks to Zoom, we're doing the next best thing, right, David? Yes. The Iron and Steel Partnership was formed in 2009 to attract visitors to and educate residents about our region in Northern Chester County and adjoining counties outside of Philadelphia, which boasts the longest history with and connection to the iron and steel industry and which has the largest collection of historic forges and furnaces located in concentration in this country. The steering committee is formed by representatives from the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, Hopewell Furnace National Historic Site, the Schuylkill River Heritage Center in Phoenixville, Historic Yellow Springs, Warwick County Park, and French and Pickering Creek Trust. We are also being joined today by our sister organization, the Rural Heritage Confederation. To guide us on our journey, I would like to introduce David Blackburn, who is also a member of the steering committee and now new director of the Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum in Lancaster, PA. The museum is administered by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. David came to Landis Valley in October 2020 after 34 years with the National Park Service and five and a half years as site director of Hopewell Furnace National Historic Site, where I had the happy occasion to meet with him as he replaced Edie Sheehan Hammond, who helped to create the Iron and Steel Heritage Partnership. Brief introduction to David's very, very um, learned past. He has a BA in anthropology from the University of Arizona and a master's in cultural resource management from Sonoma State University. Originally from Palo Alto, California, David now wisely calls Ex Exton PA Chester County home. He will introduce the program and our guests. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the kind words and to all of my uh, colleagues in uh, heritage on uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania and the other side of the Atlantic in the UK. Uh, good morning or good afternoon and, and welcome um, after several cancellations uh, due to the, the pandemic. We're all thrilled to be here with you um, today. Um, my name is uh, David Blackburn. Um, nothing like starting a new position in the midst of a global pandemic, but I come here after five and a half years at Hopewell Furnace, and uh, much of the reflections and information I'll be sharing with you is a result of having an opportunity to travel to uh, Shropshire and to the Iron Bridge Gorge World Heritage um, Area as a result of an international travel grant. Many of you joining us today are part of our um, Iron History family. Keep in mind what I'm sharing with you is from my own research and from coming of the perspective of managing uh, a Pennsylvania 18th and 19th century uh, iron plantation. Some of your perspectives may be different, but we look forward to this uh, being a uh, the start of an engaging conversation in um, our shared links across the Atlantic with iron history, as well as um, in engaging and deep conversations in how we tell the story. You'll be seeing them in a few minutes, but I'm absolutely thrilled to be co-presenting with my uh, colleagues from Iron Bridge Gorge Museum, Tu Museum Trust, um, Senior Curator of the Trust, uh, Georgina Grant, and Director of Collections and Learning, uh, Jillian Crumpton. You'll be meeting them in a few minutes. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. I will share my screen. Uh, Here we go, the miracles of modern, of modern technology. Let's see. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? 
Yes, but the slides are along the left. Okay. There we go. Perfect. And are we seeing the correct the correct view? <laughs> yes. Okay. Great. Um, well, uh, today we are exploring uh, the British and uh, American um, iron um, connections. My uh, journey through this uh, travel grant took me to this uh, fabulous locale that you see on the screen. Um, iron Bridge, the world's first and oldest um, iron bridge spanning the Severn River and the Severn River Gorge. Um, it's amazing to know that as the world's first iron bridge, it's still with us um, today, uh, serving the purpose that it did when it was first um, constructed well over 200 years ago. Uh, the foundation for this uh, program really follows along two broad uh, themes and ideas. Um, one is exploring how does this iconic bridge and all of the resources and businesses associated with it connect to our um, colonial um, iron story here in Chester, Berks, uh, Lancaster County in southeastern Pennsylvania. And the other uh, point of exploration that I'll be sharing with you is how is the iron story interpreted and told to the public um, in England? And more importantly, how can we learn uh, in our region from some of their practices in telling the story? Uh, these are the questions that drove my uh, 10 days of travel and my, my quest to um, Iron, Bridge, uh, Iron Bridge Gorge. Again, uh, for those of you who are uh, within the industry, I am coming to you from the, uh, from the uh, perspective of Hopewell Furnace. Oops. So I'm sorry. Uh, somehow we are at the end of the presentation. So if you will bear with me a moment. Here we are. So let's start in our own uh, backyard. Um, here you see um, um, a map at um, Hope of um, Hopewell Furnace, the green splotch in the middle, surrounded by uh, French Creek State um, Park. We are part of, I would say, the iron ecosystem, the iron story in the 18th and 19th century of this area. And you can see by the stars on the map how we are but one of numerous uh, forges and furnaces here in Northern Chester and Southern Berks County. Um, what I felt like, and maybe some of you feel the same way, as the manager of Hopewell, we were there to tell the story of Hopewell Furnace. And despite having these graphics and despite talking to our public and showing to our public that we were part of a larger um, ecosystem of history. There were times felt like that the story we told was much too insular, that it was uh, too focused on Hopewell, which as a National Historic Site, preserving the site is appropriate, but felt like we needed to show how it fit into the larger story. Pennsylvania's iron history it's not just Hopewell Furnace. It's um, a part of um, the, the whole. So I, I particularly wanted to focus on the 18th century story from our founding um, in 1772 to the start of the American Revolution in 1776. So I felt it was appropriate to uh, take um, a look at the center point of 18th century um, iron manufacturing in uh, England. If you look on the map, you'll see the white blob. That is uh, the county of Shropshire, where Iron Bridge uh, Gorge is located. You can see that um, it borders uh, Wales, and it is an inland county. And if it is not the largest, it's one of the largest uh, counties in um, England. 
For those of you who remember your history, um, you certainly know as part of um, the uh, growing English empire as colonies, there was robust uh, trade across uh, the Atlantic. Cod and lumber from uh, New England, uh, tobacco, as well as the triangle trade um, emulating from the South. But my question was, what about the mid-Atlantic colonies? We are sending some resources and most specifically, what about iron? So the first part of my journey was to try and see if the surviving account books, 18th century account books from furnaces and forges in 18th century Pennsylvania um, would help suss this question out. So I went, being that to the 18th century records from Hopewell are gone, I went to the Historic Society of Pennsylvania to look at um, 18th century records from several other companies in our area that existed in the 18th century. Um, I looked at ledgers from uh, a, a different Hopewell, Hopewell Forge, uh, their records from 1765 to 1767. Looked at some records from Cornwall Furnace, 1767 to 1770, and also something called the Daybook from um, Hopewell Forge. Um, alas, they were fascinating documents. They did not um, answer my question in terms of trying to understand what is being sold and exported from the colonies to England. I do want to take a side note, especially in this day and age, and notice that um, this is the scope of another presentation. But here in um, 18th century uh, Pennsylvania, um, it's very possible that there were um, enslaved uh, Africans that were enslaved individuals that were working in the iron industry. What you're seeing on the screen is uh, from a summary page from an account book. And you'll notice that all of the names are prefaced with the word uh, Negro. We do know um, as we go through time that Hopewell and very likely other stops become other furnaces and forges uh, become documented stops on the Underground Railroad. We also know in the early 19th century that Hopewell Furnace uh, supported um, a population of workers that were not enslaved, but free. So for as fascinating as this was, as you said, it's uh, worthy of more uh, research. And this is for um, another, uh, another presentation. My uh, journey took me uh, to this rather non- descript um, building. Um, for the 10 days I was in England, I was granted a uh, visiting scholar uh, status with the University of uh, Birmingham, specifically with their Heritage Management and World Heritage Studies uh, program, the um, Iron Gorge um, Institute. And it was from here that um, I used the resources of the library and I um, explored uh, the wonders of Iron Bridge Gorge. But uh, because we are blessed today with um, Jillian and with Georgina, uh, I will be uh, signing off for the time being and will be turning the presentation over to Jillian and Georgina to talk about the resources, uh, their work at the Iron Gorge uh, World Heritage Area, as well as within the Iron Gorge Museum Trust. So uh, Jillian and Georgina, go ahead and take it away. Hello, I will just um, share my screen with everyone. Can you see that? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you um, very much for introducing us, but thank you so much to everybody um, for, for having us along. We are delighted to be here. We would love to be with you in person. Um, George um, and I almost had bought plane tickets um, 
around about this time last year and then thought perhaps it wasn't a good idea, which was good because our, um, our country locked down only a week later. So the reason that we, we got in touch with, with David and some of um, some other colleagues probably on this call, we had um, started to research for an exhibition, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, and we started to make connections and we started to think, actually, let's make more connections with this iron network and see where a partnership can take us. So um, as David said, my name is Gillian Crumpton. I'm the Collections and Learning Director for the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust. I've been with the museum for 13 years, which is unbelievable to me. Um, I studied museum studies and um, modern history um, at St Andrews University. Um, modern history for us though is from 1450 to the present day. So that's what we, we call modern history in, in our strange, um, strange language that we have. Um, Georgina Grant is our senior curator at the Trust and she's been um, with the museum for seven years. Um, there's so much to do at Ironbridge that it, it sort of keeps you, it keeps you there. So I thought that we'd give a background to who we are in terms of the museum and how we're structured, what we do, and then we'll talk a bit more about our collections and then go on to tell you a little bit about our connections that we have um, with you and with um, the wider um, US as a whole. So the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust um, Limited was founded in 1967, I think. George has got the next slide, there we go. Um, we're a registered charity and an independent trust. Our twin aims are education and heritage conservation. Our vision is to be a world leading museum of industrial heritage. Our mission is to operate with entrepreneurial flair and creativity in order to inspire and engage people in the world changing story of the Ironbridge Gorge World Heritage Site. We welcome around 450,000 visitors per year um, to, the, uh, to our 10 sites and around 60,000 school children um, to our education programmes and, and workshops and site visits. We have a workforce of around about 160 people and about 360 active volunteers who work with us on a number of specific projects from research, collections management to maintenance work and also on a day-to-day -day basis as costumed interpreters at one of our sites. Um, and they also support and welcome visitors at some of our other sites. I'll just say before George moves on to this, uh, moves on from this slide, this is um, one of our key images um, from our archive collection. It is by Francois Vivares from 1758, and it shows our Colbrookdale in Shropshire. So the middle, um, the biggest bit of smoke and steam that you can see in the middle of the picture is the old furnace, which we'll talk about later. The Colbertdale Company commissioned this as a as a showpiece, as a showing off what all the all the innovative things that they were doing. So on the right hand side, you can see piles of coal being burned to turn them into coke for the blast furnace. On the left hand side, you can see a beam engine cylinder that the Colbertdale Company um, were one of the first to, to make. And in the, the background, you can see some houses, and this is where the Darby family um, stayed. As I said, one of our key images that we we, we like a lot. Thank you, George. So we look after 35 scheduled monuments and listed buildings within our portfolio. This means that they have statutory protection within um, British law. We are within the World Heritage Site of the Ironbridge Gorge and we run um, and open 10 museums. These collectively tell the story of the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in England. Um, as well as the 10 museums, the sites in our care include a research library, we have tourist information centres, two youth hostels, archaeological monuments, historic woodlands, domestic houses, two chapels and two Quaker burial grounds. So something for everyone, I would say. We generate our income primarily from visitors and um, through ticket sales and secondary spend. But we have key grants um, through um, a couple of organisations, but the most important being Arts Council England. We are what's called a national portfolio organisation for Arts Council and as such receive an annual grant, but we have to reapply for this um, every three to four years and meet um, a lot of different criteria and fit in with their strategy. We also received some funding from a sister organization, the Ironbridge Heritage Foundation. They own some of the property that we manage um, and they administer a grant to us um, on a regular basis. In normal years, we have an all year round operation with some sites closed in the winter. We have a lifelong learning programme with workshops and visits for schools, 
group visits and adult education. We work with care homes um, as a dementia friendly museum. We work with social services and um, vulnerable young people. We also work with those providing care for early years, so the under fives market. We also run large scale events like fireworks, Halloween and Christmas events to generate income. Our collections, um, all of our collections in the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust are designated of national importance. So this is a national designation. They are displayed in and alongside a series of internationally important buildings, sites and monuments and together enhance um, our understanding of Britain's industrial revolution, which in turn shaped the modern world. We like to claim a lot of things at Ironbridge, everything in the modern world started with us. In presenting a story of industrialization to the public, we interpret objects in the context of their historic setting, and we actively seek collections and archive material to reinforce our understanding of the area and its sites and monuments in terms of the industrial revolution. We've developed significant holdings over our 50 year history, and these range from archaeological and archival materials, engineering products, decorative items that include decorative metalwork and ceramics, social history collections and textile collections, some of which relate to the Quakers um, that were living and working in this area. And it was in 1997 that our collections were designated of national importance. And here you can see a pic of some of our, um, what we think are rather beautiful um, collections. So you've got some of decorative wear and then the cast iron pot, which is one of our key items in, in our um, cast iron story. The importance of the Ironbridge Gorge um, as, a, as an area was um, recognized um, in 1986 by UNESCO as it was designated a World Heritage Site. The two primary monuments for this designation um, were the Old Furnace and the Iron Bridge. So the Old Furnace represents the, both the beginnings of industrialization and the significant breakthroughs in iron making made by Abraham Darby I and the Colbertdale Company that followed in the 18th and 19th centuries. So the Old Furnace was on that first slide that I showed you. And this is where Abraham Darby first started to smelt iron with coke as a fuel instead of charcoal and made a commercial success of it. The Iron Bridge, as you can see here, it's painted in its new um, livery. It um, has undergone a major rest restoration project, um, at which finished last year, just at the beginning of last year. Um, we actually, although we're the Ironbridge Gorge Museum Trust, we don't own the Iron Bridge, um, but we um, look at, we own the Toll House, which is on top of the Iron Bridge, but it is one of our centrepiece um, items, of course, that we talk about. It is the most famous product um, made by the Coberdale Company, and it was the catalyst for the architectural use of iron and steel, which shaped the landscapes that we see around the world. We were among the first world um, heritage site in, in the UK to be designated and one of the first industrial sites in the world to be recognised, which I think is really important um, for all of us as we look at the story of industrialisation and recognising the importance of the Industrial Revolution. Good morning everyone or afternoon from England. So this uh, story of iron is told at our Colbertdale site. Here we have a range of buildings that are preserved from the Colbertdale Company Ironworks. We have the old furnace, as Gillian just mentioned. We have the Museum of Iron, there's the viaduct, the Derby houses, and that's where the Quaker Iron Masters lived, and the Quaker burial ground. This site also has our library and archives and our interactive design and technology museum called Ingenuity. The old furnace is the focal point of this site. It's seen in that pyramid building at the background. We sometimes refer to it as the most important pile of bricks in the world. Here, Abraham W. the first, he was a Quaker and brass founder from Bristol. He came and leased the furnace, and in 1709, he successfully made cast iron using coke as the fuel instead of charcoal. And this is a key turning point in iron innovation and industrialization. And it essentially resulted in cheap iron produced on a scale much larger than before. This furnace was in use until 1818, during which time we claim several world firsts. The first starts with 
cheap cast iron pots. We then have cast iron steam engine cylinders, first cast iron wheels. And this was for use on the local horse-drawn wagonways. We have the first cast iron rails, the first most famously cast iron bridge, and finally the first steam railway locomotive to run on rails in the world. So we have cast iron being introduced for domestic use, for transport, for machinery, for bridges. It was all from this tiny valley. It made the industrial revolution possible and changed the world. Abraham Darby's company was known as the Colbert Company and it expanded rapidly. Just wanted to briefly um, mention a bit more about the Derby houses. Uh, they're part of our Colbertdale site where the Iron Masters lived. On this slide, you can see Dale House. It was built in 1715 by Abraham Darby I, and it was lived in by five generations of the Darby family. The house overlooked the Colbertdale ironworks, and for many years, the company office was based here. So for two Two centuries, it was occupied by people who managed the works and a lot of important meetings took place there, such as the negotiations and talks about the construction of the Iron Bridge. The ground floor is now preserved to about the date of 1780 to look like a Quaker Iron Master's residence about the time that Abraham Darby III was living there. The second house, which you can spot on the right it's the white one just behind the trees. You can just glimpse that. That's called Rose Hill House. And it was built around 1738. Again, it was home to a series of Colbertdale um, ironmasters. Again, it's been restored. So in 1988, it was restored two, floor, uh, two stories uh, to about the date of 1848 to show what a Victorian Quaker ironmaster's house would have looked like. And in the house, there's numerous possessions that were actually owned by the Derby family. So it's quite a nice to give that context behind the day-to-day -day life of the Quakers. This is our Museum of Iron, and it's where we really tell that iron story, specifically looking at iron development in Colbertdale, in Shropshire, and the wider context in Britain, as well as the worldwide impacts. The museum, it's in chronological order, and we start the journey by looking at the geology of Shropshire and the proximity of the River Severn. So how the local raw materials of coal, clay, iron ore, limestone, and that transport link, it made this area an ideal place for industry to flourish on a huge scale. The gallery then focuses on iron working in the Iron Age and in the Roman Age, and then on to the medieval era. And certainly in Shropshire, there were several monasteries and they played a key role in industry. They operated water mill mills, they had mines, and they also had bloomery furnaces to make iron. The galleries, um, they continue with a more in-depth look into the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly looking at these key figures um, in iron innovation, such as focusing on members of the Derby family and what they did, as well as the other Shropshire iron masters, and then looking at these innovations and how they impacted on society. We also talk about the Colbert Dell Company workers. Thousands of men worked at the ironworks, and so their stories and history, that's also woven into the text panels and displays. In terms of how we interpret that history, we use a layered interpretation approach, which is different interpretation for different audiences. We have the traditional text panels and we also have child-friendly panels. Um, these feature a drawing called Rusty. He's a dog and he's based on this decorative iron table in our collection. It's an enormous hall table consisting of four life-size deer hounds. It does tend to divide opinion. You either seem to love it or hate it, but everyone remembers it. We also have a range of interactives in the museum. 
such as oral history stations, and they feature former workers describing their work for Colbertdale and also their day-to-day -day life. We have freestanding interactives as well, and they feature archival material. So we've mentioned we've got a library and archives, and we also have lots of relevant paintings and pictures and images, and also our work catalogues. We're also developing our interpretation, not only at the Museum of Iron, but across the museums, but particularly looking at activities and trails for under fives, family backpacks and sensory backpacks, which are for those with additional needs. And we're also looking at walking trails to link all our various sites together. They're located several miles apart. So if you're a keen walker, it's quite a nice way to link and see all the museums and also see a lot of the monuments in situ. So our aim is to develop our core offer and to attract, attract repeat visitors. In the 1830s, the Coverdale Company, they began producing decorative artwork and it was highly regarded. At the Great Exhibition of 1851, their display included gates, railings, fountains, statues, and it was critically acclaimed. They had one statue on display called Andromeda, which was a statue of a woman, and it was bought by Queen Victoria and you can still see it in the form of royal residence in the Isle of Wight. In this 19th century section of the museum, we wanted to put this iron into context so you can see what a domestic scene might have looked like. Here we have some rather beautiful cast iron chairs, a fire surround and a cabinet backed with this striking Victorian wallpaper. It's just to put it into that context. And we also use that method to show what everyday cast iron street furniture would have looked like. I'll now briefly turn to some of our other sites. This is Bliss Hill Victorian Town. It's an open air museum, a living history museum, and it aims to show what life would have been like living and working in the East Shropshire Coalfield around 1900. It fits into our wider Ironbridge story by showcasing the impact of the Industrial Revolution on all levels of society and on all aspects of life. The site was actually a former place of industry there were several mines, there was a blast furnace, a canal and a brick and tar works. But certainly by the 1960s, these had been left to ruin. They were gradually conserved by the trust and the rest of the Victorian town was constructed around the original LM um, scale size. Some shops and towns, they were rescued, say shops and houses, were rescued um, from demolition in the area and brought to this site, whilst others have been reconstructed based on original Victorian buildings. All staff on site, they wear period costume that's created by our wardrobe department. And these members of staff, they demonstrate various skills such as printing and candle dipping in the many workshops across the town. We use a mix of first person and third person interpretation with trained actors taking on the first person interpretation roles. And we have specific roles such as there's a policeman, there's a postman and a teacher. So at the opposite end of the gorge from Colbertdale, and the heart of the iron making developments. We have a collection of museums, so just a couple of miles um, down the river, which focus on the ceramics industries of the gorge. And we thought we'd just tell you a little bit about them to give you an overall sense of, of the full um, story of Ironbridge. So tobacco pipe making from the 17th century was happening in Broseley, just up the hill from the river. We have fine ceramics at Cathley and Coalport from the 18th century and decorative tiles and architectural ceramics at Jackfield in the 19th century. Craven Dunhill and & Co and Maw & Co factories were at the centre of this industry. 
Monaco was at one time the largest decorative tile works in the world and its impressive neighbour Craven Dunhill is now the Jackfield Tile Museum, that's the, the building that you can see here. Both these factories were designed by the same architect and laid out on model, uh, model lines, so raw materials came in at one end and finished products going out at the other, so dust to dispatch as we call it. Monco and Craven Dunhill and Co made tiles that were transported around the world and used to decorate homes, hospitals, pubs and shops in Britain, a train station in New Zealand, a bank in South Africa, palaces in India and public buildings throughout the United States of America. The Industrial Revolution in Britain combined with rapid architectural fashion and um, changes in, in fashion and a new concern for public health and hygiene led to the revival and rapid expansion of the tile industry in the 19th century. It was a marriage of beauty with utility and at the centre of this industry was the very small town of Jackfield. We've had a recent addition to Jackfield Tile Museum and this is the John Scott collection. It's one of the finest um, private collections of mid 19th to mid 20th century um, English decorative ceramic tiles in the country. It comprises of around 1200 individual tiles and just over 300 tile panels and represents the work of some of the best known designers and manufacturers of the period. John Scott was a property developer in London and he began collecting tiles in earnest in 1968. Since then he had amassed a collection that covered all the major designers of the period from 1830 to 1930 and some beyond that. In addition to significant works by William de Morgan, there are tiles and panels by AWN Pusion, Christopher Dresser, William Morris, CFA Voisey, Edward Borden and John Piper to name but a few. In addition to this, almost the entire range of manufacturing methods are represented, which makes the collection really important for those interested in both style and technique. As I said, John was a, a property developer um, based in London, although had been um, from the, the um, just a, a county above Shropshire, that's where he was originally from, and he was very keen that not everything should be held in London. And he helped us negotiate the purchase of the museum building in 1983, and after that time, and until his death um, last year, he was a strong supporter and advocate for us, declaring that he wanted Jackfield to be the greatest tile museum in the world, which is only a small bit of pressure for the curators at our um, site. He donated his entire collection to us in 2012, and we transformed an empty gallery, which had originally been the films department for Craven Dunhill in the original factory. In the gallery, we have tried to recreate um, a, a collection from a collector's point of view and to give the, the sort of feeling of John's house. Um, I visited his house and this is this looks a little bit like um, one of his living rooms. And we've also included all of his comments about the individual tiles alongside this, um, alongside each um, tile so that you get his perspective on the collection. So that's the, the ceramic side of the world that we also delve into. But we, like most museums, create and host temporary exhibitions. So this brings us back to what I mentioned at the beginning in how we became connected with David and some of our other um, American colleagues. We wanted to explore the links that highlighted the connections between the Ironbridge Gorge and America during the 18th and 19th centuries. Originally, we were doing this to mark the 300th anniversary of the founding of Pennsylvania's first blast furnace at Colbertdale and to create an exhibition featuring original archives and objects and to start to forge connections with um, who, what we view as our sister sites in, in the States. Connections were forged between Ironbridge and America in 1720 with the founding of um, the blast furnace in Pennsylvania. Quaker blacksmith Thomas Rutter, who built this blast furnace, one of his partners um, was Thomas Bayliss, who had recently arrived from England. He had been a clerk at our Colbertdale Ironworks, and he was the brother-in-law of Abraham Darby I. So he was right at the centre of the action at, um, at our sides of the pond. The American furnace, of course, we well, we believe, um, takes its name from um, the successful furnace that Darby was operating, and so was called the Colbertdale Ironworks. Our exhibition is also going to look at the importance of the network of the Society of Friends, the Quakers, the trade between the two continents, not only in pig and cast iron, which is really crucial for the 
the 18th century um, part of the story, but also looking um, further than that, looking at the decorative tile and ceramic exports um, from the Ironbridge Gorge in the 19th century. To briefly mention some of the other connections between Colbertdale and America in the 18th century, we know that Shropshire Quaker ironmasters were connected with Quakers across the Atlantic and several American Quakers visited Colbertdale, such as Joshua Gilpin in 1796 and William Savory in 1798. It's likely that they would have visited or even stayed at Dale House. Gilpin even toured the ironworks and drew pictures of the furnaces. In 1793, Deborah Darby, she was the sister-in-law of Abraham Darby III. She traveled to America with her companion called Re um, Rebecca Young. And they went there to carry out missionary work much of their time was Deborah very handily kept a diary during her time traveling around America and it's such a brilliant detailed resource of her travels what she saw and who she met the image on the left there that is um, something we have in archives here and it's a list of the packages she took on board the boat called Thomas on her way to America it includes a lot of food such as eggs, gingerbread, nuts, cakes and meat, but also alcohol, clothing and interestingly, two armchairs for the trip. There's also an interesting parallel with Coatesville's Rebecca Lucans. This mirrors the Colbertdale Company, who at the end of the 18th century, they had women at the helm of the company. Mary Rathbone, Rebecca Darby and Sarah Darby. And it was due to the Quaker beliefs in equality that the Darby women, the Darby family women were educated and they held shares in the company. After Abraham Darby III's death, the company looked to the partners and the shareholders to guide the company. And at this time, it was in debt due to the building of the Iron Bridge. Rebecca and Sarah Darby, they played a crucial role during this time and this period of management became known as petticoat management. Furthermore, in 1802, led by Sarah Darby, this is when the Colbertdale Company was responsible, responsible for building the world's first steam railway locomotive. And then just to have a quick look at some 19th century connections, and these tend to include the international exhibitions, the export of products, and particularly tiles to America. As we've mentioned earlier, the Ironbridge Gorge was also the world center for the decorative tile industry. Both Crave and Dunhill and Monco, they exported tiles for churches, for banks, railway stations, public baths, and office buildings across the globe. Moore & Co won awards at the Philadelphia Exhibition of 1876, and they mounted a huge display at the Philadelphia Exhibition, oh sorry, no, at the Chicago World Fair, which is the image you can see here. And this included sections of the church and a bathroom, as well as this 20 foot high colonnade, which demonstrated the potential of architectural faience. This was eventually placed in the Columbia Museum in Chicago, which I believe is now the Field Museum. Both of these tiles, they had agents in the United States. Moore's was represented in New York, Chicago, and Cincinnati. And American buildings in which their tiles were used, we know some of these, and they include the Bank of Commerce in Kansas City, the Great Northern Hotel in Chicago, and the Central Telegraph Office in New York. We also have some examples of workers from the Ironbridge Gorge emigrating to America, and particularly American companies, they did attract artists from Britain. To give an example, the Colbertdale Company, uh, along with Craven, Dunhill and Moore and & Co, they often paid for their employees to attend art classes at the local School of Art. 
and records show that these students, they went on to work in the local industries of iron and ceramics, but some did go further afield. And there was a chap called Cecil Jones. He attended the School of Art. He was very successful. He won lots of medals. He was a highly gifted designer. And in 1913, he moved to America to work at a tile factory as a designer in Ohio. And we know that by 1930, he had moved to Los Angeles where he was working as a ceramicist. And then also in the reverse, we know of at least one American working for the Colbridgeau Company. And that was at the end of the 19th century. He was called Edward Squire and he was born in New York. He was a Quaker and his uncle was the managing director of Colbridgeau. So I suspect it was those connections which drew him back well, to England and to work for Colbertdale Company. Our exhibition is due to open, all being well, in February 2022. And we're currently developing this research. But one of the important parts of this exhibition and our ongoing research is to build our partnerships and our iron network which is why we're so thrilled to have been invited to this meeting and just thank you so much for having us. Uh, Jillian and Georgina, thank you so much. Uh, before we transition to the, the last part of the program, we have some questions that have come in. I think two of them you have um, addressed. Um, the first was, is there a documented connection between Colebrookdale Furnace in Pennsylvania and Colebrookdale um, there in Ironbridge Gorge. And I think uh, it seems to be that there very clearly is. <laughs> um, the second question also, um, I think you touched upon uh, one of our early iron masters associated with Colebrookdale was Thomas Rudder, who was um, a Quaker. Um, and the question is, is there a coincidence that Thomas Rudder is um, creating Colebrookdale is a Quaker and that you have uh, the Darbys as Quakers, um, Quakers too. Um, maybe you can just touch upon uh, the Quakers are uh, also involved with other um, iron manufacturing points throughout uh, Shropshire and other points. Is, have you been able to document why the Quaker um, connection so consistently through um, 18th century iron manufacturing? I think um, for us, one of the main things we look at is the, uh, the development of Quaker networks, particularly in England, but then also um, the transatlantic network of Quakers was so strong um, that it didn't just stay within faith lines. It was about building networks and businesses. And I think, um, lots of different avenues in, in Britain were blocked to Quakers. So because you had to swear an oath um, to go into university, then you, they wouldn't swear an oath. So, because that would imply that they had been lying at other times. I'm sure lots of you know all of these things. Um, so they couldn't go to university. So you couldn't become a doctor, you couldn't become a lawyer. Um, there were lots of different avenues blocked from them. And originally, you know, there was the, the persecution as well. So it seemed the industry became quite a natural avenue that was open to them um, and the strength of the networks meant that for our story anyway if one of the the Darb the Abraham Darbys there's three of them four of them but the first three they died quite quite young but some one of the other Quakers would step in and help manage the company until the next Abraham Darby was old enough to take over the company so I think the Quaker network and that doesn't just belong in England, it's the transatlantic Quaker network is so strong, particularly in this 18th century. And I think that the business and entrepreneurial side that's been developed in this 18th century naturally translates to, to the American story as well. I think that was what was being asked. <laughs> yes. And then it sounds like uh, for your exhibition in 2022, um, this is going to be part of the focus of it is this uh, transatlantic Quaker connection. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Uh, um, one other thing too is that, do you, I think we talked about this offline, is that do you have documentation, archival documentation of Thomas Rudder actually uh, visiting Ironbridge Gorge or is it just the connection with his, um, his partner coming? 
to America from Iron Bridge? I don't, sadly, I think we don't have anything in archives at all. Okay. No, it's just, it's mainly the Thomas Bayless, which is before we were locked down, we were in the middle of investigating the um, archives and newspaper records, looking at Thomas Bayless and how, how the connection came about. So I think there's still more to discover about the connection between that, that pair and how they, how they were connected. Um, but that's something that we're still looking into and happy for anybody to offer up any little nuggets of information for us. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, next question is, when was the old furnace built and initially operated? So we believe that it was built in 1658. So the Brooke family, they were um, iron masters in Colbrookdale before the Darbys. And after the dissolution of the monasteries in the 15, by 1540, a lot of the land had been opened up and was available for entrepreneurs to sort of take parcels of land and be gifted parcels of land by, um, by royalty. So the, the sort of monastic orders had owned a lot of the land. We were in the, the Priory of Much Wenlock. And um, so the Brooke family moved in, they were able to buy up different bits of land and they actually re-engineered the landscape of Cobrookdale for industry. So there are pools of water that have been built all the way down the valley to get to the river. And they were all built by different generations of the Brooke family. And then there was one person in between the Brooke family and Abraham Darby, whose name was Shadrach Fox, and he operated the furnace. And we believe he was trying to smelt iron with coke as a fuel, but he didn't make the commercial success of it, which is why Abraham Darby gets the credit. And I think there was a large storm in um, 1705. No, 17 I can't remember the dates now. I shouldn't, I shouldn't guess dates. Um, at which the the fern the dam wall exploded and the um collapsed and the and the furnace exploded. So um Shadrach Fox um left pretty swiftly after that. It was a bit too much to deal with. <laughs> um you mentioned um a diary kept by um is it uh, Rebecca Darby on her trip um, to um Deborah Darby. Deborah Darby. Trip to America. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, diary digitized and available for viewing online? It is. It is digitized. Is it digitized? Well, it's a sensible fashion. It's a book. Um, it is. It was a book. Um, a. I happen to have a copy of the book on my desk. Of Deborah Darby. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, so she transcribed it and added in various notes and oh okay. I assume it's available to buy um, I'm not quite sure on that but there are there's there's the book of it is there a link on the Iron Bridge website for an online store where you can buy it through your organization or is it best to go through um, I don't think there is but um so it was it's just called Deborah Darby it was by Rachel Labouchere and it's been published by Sessions of York, but I don't know if it's still in publication. So anybody okay. who wants information, just get in touch and we'll see what we can yeah. do. Mm -hmm. Or um, Jillian, if you could put that into the chat, uh, that information into the chat, um, our, our viewers can, can look at it. Um, let's see, uh, was the co-location of the iron and tile works related to the closeness of resources or a skilled workforce? Maybe it's a little of both. I would say the resources are um, just hugely important in the establishment of both the ironworks and the ceramic industries. You have everything there. You've got the river for transport, you've got the coal, clay, iron ore, limestone. It's just everything you need really for your industry to develop. Um, but the area did attract workers from further afield, but the majority of the workers were local. Yes, and then finally, the oh, go on. So I was going to say that the Colbrookdale itself was a very small hamlet. And it's so up when you get to about mid seven, I think it was about 1758, it talks about it starting to flourish with the community and sort of a, a couple of, a few hundred people are living there by that point. So it's definitely, as George was saying, it's definitely the raw materials and the fact that we're in a narrow wooded valley. So it's easy to dam your access to the charcoal, which is what everybody was after then, was right there. So, and you didn't have to transport the charcoal far. So you've got the raw materials, you've got the valley, 
you can you've got the water power has been built there you're so you're good to go and then as George says it attracts it attracts people and the quake the Derby's and um, built working and um, built houses for some of their workers and um, I think again to attract and um, skilled workers to the area. We have a very specific question. Uh, this would be for you, George. Uh, do you have any archival info about Robert <coughs> Robert Grace visiting the ironworks in England? Do you know off the top of your head? I, I don't know, I'm afraid, off the top of my head. Um, it might be mentioned in, so a few of the Derby women actually kept diaries and um, they note who visits. So I can certainly have a look, but. Yeah, I'm not sure off the top of my head. We have two uh, just general com uh, comments of uh, good presentation. Connections of Quaker heritage and industrial heritage are fascinating. Thank you. Um, someone else states that they visited Ironbridge Gorge in 1975 as an exchange student and in oh 1986 goodness. with my then new husband. Can't wait to return in 2022. <laughs> A uh, final question before we go to the final part of the program. Are there any drawn construction plans of England's Culbertdale furnace that may be used, that may have been used when blast furnaces in Pennsylvania were constructed? <clears throat> hmm. There are some, there was a visitor, um, I think he came from Sweden, I want to say, George will correct me, Angerstein. Mm -hmm. who I think was an industrial spy who came to look at the works and he did a, an early sort of sketch of Colbrookdale but how far that was used and, and how much how widely spread that that became I don't know. There were then some um, later engravings and um, imagery of in the sort of 18th century blast furnaces I'm thinking of a smelting house at Brosley and um, inside of a smelting house but they weren't um, sort of technical drawings per se. George, do you have anything to add? No, I, no, I'm afraid I can't add much more. I don't, it's hard to say. I think that one of the main ways that the information was spread was through the Quaker network. So I think that their monthly and yearly meetings, um, yearly meetings were held in, in London. I think, um, that was a really good way to spread information. And I can imagine that there being discussions at these, at these items. And there were a lot of Quakers who came to visit from America and, and back forth. So I think there, there is a general sharing of ideas, I believe, um, but again, something to look into. Well, with the explosive growth of mechanized textile manufacture uh, coming out of England in the late 18th <clears throat> century, that technology was very much considered proprietary. Yeah. And uh, the only reason why, um, uh, for example, out of uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, Samuel Slater, otherwise known as Slater the Trader, uh, he came from the textile industry of England and he brought in his mind the detailed workings of, of uh, some of the mechanized machines and then replicated them here. So I don't know if that sense of proprietary technology was as secretive within the iron industry as it was in the textile industry. I think, I think it, there was some element of secrecy and we did certainly talk about sort of spies and people coming to look at the technology and look at what's happening. So there's um, Charles Hornblower um, mm -hmm. in the 1780s. So he originally worked for the Colbertdale Company, but then it seems that he, he wrote some notes just for himself as he then went to a different ironworks. So it's, um, it is interesting. And I don't know, you know, with Thomas Bayliss, is he taking over that information that he's got of Abraham one starting that process of smel smelting with coke and, and how the blast furnace is operating, the sort of yields that they're getting, the, the, the amount of water that they need, all those sorts of that sort of information he would have been, he would have known and he would have been involved with. So how much of that then is of course being translated to, to Thomas Rutter and, and success of people, I don't know. Okay. So final question before we move on, uh, the first of the Derby houses or the beautiful Derby house as the questioner asks, was it built before the furnace or after the furnace was running? After, after. about six years after Dale House was built. And then- okay. So it's 20, about 20 years after Rose Hill House was built. 
And Great. Abraham, you know, Abraham one was going to live there. He died just as it was finished being built. Mm. But then the Quaker Iron Masters lived there. And, and the perspective of Dale House is you stand out on the front step and you can see the blast furnace down to your right. And you can see the pool of water that supplies the, the that runs the furnace. So I can imagine those Quaker Iron Masters standing on their front doorstep, right. knowing that they're getting to the summer period when the water is getting low and they're going to have to stop the furnace, repair the furnace and then and start their start their next campaign so it's I think there's a, a really interesting way he lived really close to the works which is again mm -hmm. quite unusual in that 18th century he didn't live far away he was a direct directly involved in running the works great well uh, what we'll do is we'll transition to the last part of the program where we focus um, on kind of lessons learned from the work that uh, Georgina and Jillian are doing along with all of their colleagues uh, at the Museum Trust uh, with some concepts and ideas that um, coming from my perspective as a museum professional and someone who's worked in uh, the story of iron here in Pennsylvania as well as the larger industrial story that may be of interest to all of you in terms of um, best practices for interpretation. So let me uh, share my screen um, again. Okay, so, um, Best practices and lessons learned. One of the things David, that- David, we're seeing the two oh, screens if you want to swap. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, here we go. One of the things that, um, although Ironbridge Gorge has tangible and physical elements in the landscape that go back to um, early iron making, what I walked away from was their attempts to put what happened in Ironbridge Gorge into a larger local, regional, and international context. That it was more than just what happened in Shropshire in Ironbridge Gorge. And through their exhibitions, they helped to connect it to a larger story. So let me give you an example of the way it's done in the landscape is that outside the boundaries of the world heritage um, area, but within uh, the area of the Iron Bridge Gorge, there are two former um, abbeys that are connected to um, the iron story, uh, pre-industrial connections of iron. The first is from the 13th century, um, according to uh, a publication published by the Shropshire History, um, Iron Gazetter. Uh, here at uh, Buildwest Abbey, there was um, iron, uh, an iron manufacturing point, probably um, a bloomery. But it's 13th century. And interestingly enough, they are, as Iron Bridge was in the 17th and 18th century, taking advantage of the resources that are right there adjacent to the um, abbey to uh, create iron for their use. Um, another abbey, a much when look, um, in some documentation from when the uh, priory was dissolved by Henry VIII in 1540, it was recorded that there were two foundries um, on the site of uh, much Wenlock. So again, it's a priory taking advantage of the resources to be taking advantage um, in the 18th century by uh, the priory. Uh, the documentation that was accessible to me uh, didn't state whether it was clergy or lay folk that were um, operating uh, this, but uh, the operations were there. So turning to how this um, connects to the way the story is told in an all-encompassing way at the um, Iron Bridge, one is the very first thing that you see in their galleries is not are not exhibits proclaiming the glories of Iron Bridge and the Darbys, but they go to the very beginning, the core elements that all of us connect to on either side of um, the Atlantic on the iron story. It goes to the elements that are needed to create iron. Um, so you see here uh, exhibits that focus on fuel, 
coal and the iron ore itself. You also see uh, flux and limestone um, highlighted there. And then because industrialization in the valley goes beyond um, iron to clay, you can see they talk about the raw ingredient of um, clay. One of the things that I really appreciated, and this goes back to uh, the Priory, is that you're putting the iron story into a larger context of the ingredients. And then there are exhibitions that talk about uh, Machwinlock, the Priory's iron uh, within the context of uh, the late Middle Ages, but also it goes back to the classical period, to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age. One of the things I appreciated here is that they show that metallurgy and iron is part of the larger human um, story. I find that interesting in that maybe I don't want to make assumptions with what some of you do, but we delve directly into Hopewell Furnace or other furnaces. This is Hopewell. This is what they did. We never talk about what they're using, the core ingredients. This is iron, this is charcoal, this is coal. Some of it is delved with in uh, personal services and programs we do on site. But here the orientation first starts um, you and immerses you into um, a much larger story. You can see it in the landscape by going outside of the gorge to see these ruins, but we know that within museums in the Philadelphia area, you can also see examples of metal coming from pre-European contact um, civilizations in the Mississippi River Basin and other parts of um, North America. It's a large story, but I believe it is a lesson that we can learn um, in terms of expanding how we interpret our iron story and how we tell that story to the public. The other thing is that throughout the Iron Museum, you can see um, iron, is, iron is only made in stars much bigger than our sun. Um, it's, there are panels throughout the museum that connect to children and families that connect in simpler language to um, this larger story here it connects to where does iron coming from. But if you'll notice, they take advantage of uh, the, the pooch here that uh, Georgina uh, mentioned. I found it um, fascinating in that it is a direct relation to an object in their gallery, the Deerhound uh, table from 1855. As uh, Georgina said, you love it or you hate it. I loved it and I love the fact that they took an object on display of iron and used it as a visual clue for um, a journey with uh, families through, um, through the site. Iron in our lives. Many of us um, in iron heritage in our area uh, display and talk about the implements that were made uh, for the consumer at the forges we preserve. Um, what I felt like Iron Bridge did is that they told the story more broadly with uh, more direct interpretation. And more importantly, as you've already seen with this cast iron at home, although Hopewell and Cornwall and other furnaces are not producing domestic ironware, as you see here from uh, the 19th century. I don't have a picture of it, but iron, the Iron Museum shows the use of iron in our urban environments all the way through the 20th century. They show a post box, a mailbox. They show a cast iron light standard. They show a cast iron uh, bench. This may not be appropriate for all of us, but it helps to show the journey of iron in our lives through time and the journey of iron beyond any one individual, individual site. It may not be appropriate for all of us, but it very much um, is appropriate for the story that Iron Bridge um, is telling. The other thing that uh, you've seen is that 
there are elements of industrialization throughout the landscape of the World Heritage Site that show other elements that support iron industry, but that also support the increasing industrialization. Although we don't necessarily have tangible sites beyond iron in our region, we know industrialization goes beyond what we preserve. We do have the uh, what um, is and will become the large scale National Museum of Iron and Steel um, in Coatesville uh, that goes beyond cast iron to the iron story. But there's other 18th century industries, uh, grist mills, water based industries, as well as industries that replace um, our family run iron uh, sites in the 19th century. And we have opportunities to show in Chester County and Berks County through both tangible and non-tangible resources that we are one part of a larger industrial story. This is uh, something called the tar tunnel, um, part of a transportation network. And Georgina and Jillian can correct me. I think it was to mine a, a natural tar by bituminous uh, 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 source. And then this is the uh, China Museum below. Finally, uh, I want to show this picture you've already seen. And George and uh, Jillian uh, alluded to it, is that there's fascinating connections between the geography of Colebrookdale and the geography of our 18th and 19th century furnaces. As you look to the old works, you see on your left the railroad viaduct. If you were to remove the viaduct through that viewpoint, you see the iron community. You would see, actually through the arches, the Derby houses, and you would also see workers' cottages. So when you think of the iron plantations that were built in our area, where the iron master's house, the workers' cottage, and the furnace are all relatively close together, you may not see it here, but it's a fascinating parallel uh, between Colebrookdale and our, uh, not our 19th century um, villages in uh, Pennsylvania and um, other parts of the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, uh, here we go. And I wanna mention just on a personal note, the Jack uh, Field Tile Museum, I found this a very surprising and engaging way of um, immersing you into another part of the industrial story. I, I, I told them that you uh, come from the eye for the iron and you stay for the ceramics. Um, having somewhat of a background in decorative arts, I was absolutely enthralled by this story and partially because it was so surprising, but also aesthetically um, beautiful. When they talk about Craven and Dunhill's work, Here's examples that they have on display. You do see it in the United States, but it also emulates the ceramic, decorative ceramic tile um, industry that uh, developed in the United States. The museum, as it immerses you in iron, it immerses you in ceramics, and that there are rooms with entire ceramic tableaus that were manufactured for um, 19th century businesses. This would have been for um, a butcher shop, this would have been for um, a pub. And then this is a decorative um, tile work for um, a bathroom and then for a commercial institution. So again, it's not necessarily appropriate for us, but it's an opportunity to think about how do we put our institutions in the context of larger industrialization within Chester and Berks County. The final thing I'd like to, um, uh, focus on was uh, something that I wanted to investigate, and that was, can we find documentation of imports and exports in the 18th century to and from England for, uh, from our area? And I'm happy to say that National Archives of England in Kew has digitized their import and export records, and I was able to capture the records of which I'm about to show you a brief sample of from 1768 to 1773. Uh, the first is our pages that are uh, an account for a single year 
of exports from North America to ports of Great Britain between January 5th, 1770 and January 5th, 1771. If you look on the left um, column, you'll take note of ports throughout uh, colonial North America. And I have um, focused on Philadelphia in the middle. If you look above, you will see a, a partial listing of some of the items that are um, exported. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in so you can see this a little better. Here you can see uh, uh, listings of dried fish, pickled flesh, flaxseed, wheat, uh, ginger, ginseng, cotton, um, dozens and dozens of materials that were exported from uh, the colonial ports to England. But what I was interested in is what you see here, that indeed there are exports from the uh, port of Philadelphia with uh, bar iron and pig iron. And you'll see where the uh, cursor is. In this one year, of trade, 78.17 uh, tons of bar iron from the port of Philadelphia was transported to the ports of uh, Great Britain, and 1,569 tons of pig iron was imported to uh, Britain. Now, one of the issues with the way these records are compiled is that it's a compilation of a year of trade, and it's to the ports of Great Britain. So this may have become, been coming to the port of uh, Bristol, uh, which is at the mouth of the Severn, but it also may have been coming to the ports um, at other ports of, um, of um, England, uh, London, Portsmouth, um, et cetera. So it requires further research, but throughout the 18th century, you definitely see uh, transatlantic trade in bar and pig iron. Uh, the next I want to show is one brief sample of imports. For those of you who remember our history uh, as uh, colonies, we were to send uh, raw materials to Britain. They were to send uh, finished materials back to the colonies. So what I focused here is a page from the same period of time, January 5th, 1770 to January 5th, 1771 of um, produce or manufacture from Great Britain and Ireland imported into uh, colonial America. So here you see uh, imported into Philadelphia in this period, there were 8.16 tons of wrought iron imported into the port and then 105 tons of cast iron uh, brought into uh, the port of Philadelphia. Now, what it was cast by, this doesn't show, but more likely than not, it's a uh, cast uh, consumer product, similar to what you saw on display in, um, in uh, the Museum of Iron. So where does this uh, leave us? Is that uh, it very clearly shows, and I espouse that we are part of a larger of a larger story, not only domestically but um, internationally too. And it is an opportunity, where appropriate, for some of our sites to look at programming and exhibits to show that Cornwall, Hopewell, Phoenixville, uh, uh, Warwick that they are important in of, of themselves, but, and we are important to share those stories, uh, but we are part of a larger um, ecosystem. We do not function in isolation. Um, it's also important to me that um, however we tell the story, we never lose the process, but that also we need to expand and really focus on the people who expedited that process and the people of the furnace. As you see, the various physical manifestations in Iron Bridge, uh, Iron Bridge uh, Gorge, uh, of which there are many, it got me to thinking, what are other physical manifestations of our iron story um, that are beyond our borders 
that merit identification and uh, interpretation, all of which provide the opportunity to fill out our 18th century story with more uh, content. Research uh, needs. So for those of you who have connections to master's uh, students or uh, doctoral students, obviously there's this really provocative Quaker connection on both sides of the, um, of the Atlantic. One of the things that I didn't have the time is who are the iron brokers in the colony? Who colonies, who are the individuals that Mark Bird, for example, at Hopewell is working with to facilitate sale of pig and bar iron to uh, ships from the port of Philadelphia going over to the colonies. Continuing the search for sale, sale records and continuing the search for more granular um, import records, both from um, England and from the colonial ports. So as we wrap up our presentation and uh, look at the final connections, um, I leave you with this um, story to show how industrialization, past and present, whether it's in the beauty of uh, the Iron Bridge Gorge or our own area, is interconnected to our lives um, today. We cannot understand who we are as a people without looking at what this period wrought for us physically, economically, socially, and, um, and culturally and um, how these stories link to not only our own peoples, but link to our collective stories um, across the Atlantic. So as we turn to uh, the setting sun on the lands above Iron Gorge, looking at not only the beautiful countryside, but uh, signs of 21st century technology and uh, uh, industry, I hope this opportunity gave you a chance to show the linkages across uh, the Atlantic and the provocative nature of the uh, iron making landscapes between Southeastern Pennsylvania and uh, Iron Bridge Gorge in Shropshire. So with that, uh, what I'd like to do is turn to our final um, questions and uh, then wrap things up from um, there. So for uh, Jillian and Georgina and myself, one of the things that were, and then for my colleagues in this area, and then for uh, my colleagues at um, Hopewell, uh, Hopewell Furnace, um, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Jones and uh, Mr. Neil Koch, if you're on, on the line, is um, a broad question is what are the additional uh, collaborations that are possible in the future? And um, a connection to that is when uh, will you, Jillian Georgina, be visiting us sometime in the, the near future as part of your uh, research for this um, project? We'd like to. Um, neither of us can imagine leaving our county at the moment because our brains have become very local of because, of the, because, of, because of this pandemic but um i'm really hopeful depending on how things go we'd love to be able to visit this autumn this fall i'll use your language um but it just depends on on how it goes so all being well we will try and come and see you and we will be bothering you all trying to get more partnerships and working together and um, and we're looking at, um, I know we've been in discussions with, with some of you already about um, possibly borrowing um, loan items for the exhibition, for example. Um, so I think, um, and then there's a question about sort of wider collaborative work. I think that um, one of the things that we're just keen to, to explore is what, what are the opportunities? Are there online you know, discussions, workshops, seminars? Are there online exhibitions that we can do together? Are there physical exhibitions that we can do together? Is there a research paper? Is there a podcast? You know, I think there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, to talk about our shared experiences and to look at research avenues, particularly, um, as David was saying, around the Quaker stories, around that early, that 18th century iron networks and, and how those networks, how are they working? What is the operation? And, and really to sort of draw those out. So I think there's some, I think there's a lot of work in our futures together and um, we'd be delighted if anybody got in touch with us about that. 
Um, just to clarify that within your own experience within, um, and I know that uh, there's a little issue with the European Union, but uh, are, are there within the Commonwealth or the EU or even within Great Britain, are there existing heritage-based industrial collaboratives that we can uh, emulate or uh, is this something that's kind of uh, something what we would have to invent, um, invent on our own? I think the, the sort of biggest collaborative network is the European Route of Industrial Heritage, which um, is really, I can't remember, we were one of the founding members of the, of the organisation. It's a lot of um, iron and um, industrial sites, particularly in, in sort of continental Europe and Germany um, in particular and around. So there's, there's a good group there that look at industry, they're looking at how to create sort of roots and how to create partnerships. So there's a little bit that we can take from them. And then uh, there's a final question. Uh, we talked a little bit about gender, the connection between um, our own Rebecca Lukens and uh, the, the, the Darby women. Do you go beyond that and link uh, the larger story of women's suffrage to the development of of cook stoves and other um, iron-based conveniences uh, for uh, the kitchen and, and, and make that broader connection to uh, changing social roles, changing expectations of work, those, those, those kinds of things, or is that uh, too broad of a focus for the limited space of the museum? <laughs> I would say that we probably cover that more at Bliss Hill in um, our, our curator there has developed a, a women's history tour. So I su suspect that she covers that um, in there. But we also just commissioned a piece of research about women working in the industries of the gorge. So somebody to do that census research for us to look at who were the women that were working in the industries of the gorge. And you know, was it a solely a man's world? Where were the women doing the, the sort of hard labor as well and we've got some really interesting stories about um the Shropshire pit girls who were um collecting um iron stone it was a really hard dangerous um difficult job and um, there was a rope maker who was a woman there's 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 good examples of women working in the industries we've also started looking at disability within the industrial workforce both in terms of um disability that happens as a result of working in the industries, but also people who were working in the industries and who already had a disability. And there's some really interesting findings that, that are coming out of that work too. So we, there are some broader things that we're trying to do. Um, just a question of well, time. More, more opportunities for transatlantic uh, collaboration and cooperation. And then finally, um, the nonprofit that works with Hopewell Furnace, the Friends of Hopewell Furnace, is in the process of, um, of um, publishing a book on Thomas Rudder. And they would love to get um, that uh, a copy of that plate, the picture that you showed of the Culpertdale uh, cast stove, stove plate. So I guess, uh, Georgina we, or Jillian, we can connect them uh, to you to uh, procure that. Yeah. Um, I think we have two things marked in our collections marked Colbrookdale, your Colbrookdale okay. as opposed to ours. So there's the, the door, which I mm -hmm. think I, I, I will find the information as to where we got it from because I think it's an interesting story about where it yeah. came from. Um, and then there's some what's the other thing that we've got, George? Something to do it's with a, a um, it's a whole um, essentially something used to hold a flat iron. But it says um, on it. So maybe there's two pictures. <laughs> and so finally, uh, maybe this is something that's uh, more particular, keeping note of the, the time frame. Um, going back, especially to the earliest point of the 17th century work, um, do you have documentation of indentured uh, servants or enslaved peoples um, having worked anywhere in uh, the iron, any facet of the iron industry? Not enslaved peoples. Um, there's some, there'll be some sort of indentured people, and I think we have some records. I couldn't say off the top of my head. Um, George, I don't know if you can. No, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. 
Well, with that, um, I just want to extend my huge thanks and um, uh, gratitude, uh, Jillian and George. I know it was a relevatory opportunity for me to interact with you and interact with the resources of, of Iron Bridge. It really uh, broadened and changed my perspective. And although I'm no longer at Tim Hopewell, our collection here at Landis Valley includes uh, German manufactured from the 19th century uh, cast uh, stove and cast iron from the Lancaster County furnaces that uh, developed uh, in the post-revolution period. So um, it seems as if I can't get away from iron. And uh, Karen, uh, to you and your colleagues with uh, Chester County Planning Commission, uh, so uh, my, my our hats off and our gratitude to you. Well, I just wanna thank you all and Georgina and Dillian, please let us welcome you next fall. Um, we, we, I, I, We'd love to have you join our Iron and Steel Heritage Partnership. It will <laughs> bridging the Atlantic. Um, I'm, I'm sure more will come of this. And David, thank you so much. He kept telling us this was an opportunity we just couldn't miss. And, and it certainly was. It was just a wonderful, wonderful morning or afternoon to spend with you. Thank you. And we, we look forward to introducing you to the culinary pleasures of our area. Oh, yes. Uh, Cheesesteaks, scrapple, pretzels, and uh, the like. <laughs> we had us at cheesesteaks. We'll yeah. be there. Can't wait. Thank well, you again we'll, so much. We'll be in touch. Thank you for everything. And uh, bid Thank you, you for uh, us. farewell. Thank, Thank you very much.